Hey guys, it's Ryan from Red Panda Recording. I'm here with Mario McNulty in his studio, Incognito NYC, uh, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, Mario's worked with everybody from David Bowie to the Ravenettes to Lou Reed. Uh, very extensive bio you can check out uh, in the description below. Um, Mario, thanks for having us for Studio Hank. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so, Mario, your background is primarily as a, as a drummer. Um, do you think there's something specific about being a drummer and having that role in the band that lends itself well to being an engineer? That's a good question. I think there's actually a lot of drummers that become engineers or producers or right. mixers. Um, yeah, I don't, I, it's funny. Somebody should maybe do a write a book on that or make a documentary about that because there's a lot of drummers that seem to go into that that world. Um, I don't know if I can put my finger on it, but I know it certainly helps me. I mean, I think anybody who's making records, if they have a musical background, um, certainly I know a lot of people that make records that they play piano or they play guitar or, or multi-instrumental, multi-instrumentalists, but um, I, I'm a little unique in the fact that I'm a drummer. Um, mm -hmm. but, but when I got to New York and I started making records for real, um, when I moved here from Arizona, I realize it's a lot more common than I than I thought, and there's a lot of drummers that become producers and mixers, and maybe there's something about the rhythmic element of making music that helps in some way. I know it helps me. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I mean, I try to keep my approach to things as musical as I can, but somehow, yes, the drummer uh, in me is always there. You know what I mean? Right. So, so maybe I'm hypersensitive to certain things in an album. Um, I, that might be a good thing, though. I don't know. Um, sure. Yeah, but it's, it, I've thought about that before, and I know people have asked that question before about drummers that, that become producers, and Butch Vig's a good example of right. a drummer who became a producer, and it happens a lot. Yeah, and um, I mean, my own feelings is uh, not being inside your head or someone else's head, but I do feel like um, drummers tend to have a very close connection with the singer and with the song which I think obviously when you get into the production side and the mixing side, um, you know, my background being a guitar player, I maybe get a little too focused on, you know, that, that kind of my own little world. And um, how do you feel about that in, in terms of your connection to the song when you're working on material? Um, I think that's a, I think it's a good point. I mean, drummers are, I mean, they're the backbone of, of the band. I mean, mm -hmm. especially when you're playing live. I mean, there's an, there's this old saying that I forgot who told me this originally, but you could have a really great live band and if they have a drummer that isn't very good, they're still not going to sound very good live because mm -hmm. once you have a drummer that's not locking in or depending on how good or bad they are, but if they're not great, the band's not going to sound great. But on the other hand, you could have a band that's actually not really that great Maybe even the guitar players, you know, flubbing some stuff and whatever. But if they have a rock solid drummer and the drummer is fantastic, the band will actually probably sound pretty good. Yeah. So so it's it's extremely important. So I think maybe inherently the drummers um I know I feel this way. They know that they're kind of the backbone and they're 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 doing they're giving all the support to the song you know, going back to what you said about the song. And so you have to really keep that as a focal point. So, yeah, I think I think there's something to that. Sure. I mean, I know for me in productions or, or even in just mixing, to me it's still always about the song. It's not really about anything else. I mean, it is after you make the song first priority. So song is priority number one. And then after that, depending on the, on the group and depending on what, what style it is, it could be a couple different elements. But basically we're talking song, and then after that, usually vocal, and then it and then it kind of goes from there. But the song is the most important part. Yeah. So now, would you say when you um, we'll talk about production later? But on the, the mixing side of things, so you do a lot of uh, great mixing work in this room. Um, do you tend to start with the drums first, or where do you go into a song? That's a good question. I do. I mean, I, 
in the beginning of me starting to, to mix stuff on my own, on one hand, yes, I'm a drummer, so you might think, all right, well, I'm starting that way because I'm a drummer. That's not really the case. I mean, I'm comfortable with drums, and I, I like drums and in that way. I like recording them, mixing them, and, and that sort of thing. But on the other hand, the way I work, um, especially nowadays, it, whether it's a hybrid setup, all analog or all in the box digital, gain structure is so important. And so I start with the drums to start establishing where things lie um, mm -hmm. with levels and stuff like that. Um, and of course, there, you're making adjustments as you go. But I do start with drums and rhythm. I mean, basically, for me, it's drums and bass. And that's where I, I start. And then usually after that, I actually put the vocal in next. So that might sound odd to a lot of people. And nobody really showed me that. It's just something that I started doing on my own. And I kind of got used to working that way. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's kind of gain structure reasons. So I'll get rhythm, drums, and then bass. And I'll see where bottom is sitting. I'll see where the punch of the song is sitting with the transients of kicks and snares and that sort of thing. And then after that, I want to see where the vocal is fitting right away. Now, that may sound funny because I may not be getting any real melodic information, mm -hmm. but the vocal is, it still has to be sitting comfortably in that mono section of the song, which is with what we're talking about. There's a lot of mono information there, kick, snare, bass, vocal. That's especially in a, in, a, in a rock band or something like that, those are almost always mono instruments. I mean, now sometimes you might have a stereo bass or something like that, but, and you'll have a stereo field with drums or room mics or that sort of thing. But really, you're still focused on mono mm -hmm. on, uh, at that point. So that's, that's really where I start. And I, 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 in the beginning, I kind of thought, I know I'm doing it this way, but I've always been told, don't, don't start that way. And there are certain extremely... Uh, well-known famous mixers that say no don't solo anything or, or don't um whatever you do start with the vocal first mm -hmm. or start with the vocal so you can use all the good compressors in the room on that first and then you kind of build build backwards and i could never i've, I've tried it and i could never get the result i really wanted unless it was like a very sparse ballad or something like that and and it always seemed to kind of be a, a, a strange uh, exercise for me to try and get the song really happening mix-wise mm -hmm. with me having the, the, the starting with the vocal. So I just didn't do it. And then I saw an interview a while back, and I think it was with Andrew Sheps, who's a very well-known, successful sure. uh, mixer, and he's absolutely fantastic. And he's got a lot of good um, stuff that he's talked about. But one of the things that he said that kind of made me think, all right, I'm not crazy, is I start with drums. And he also kind of said the same thing, like, people might think that's weird, but that's just the way I hear it, and I start with drums. And I thought, okay, I'm not too, I'm not crazy. Because right. I, I do the same thing. I start right. with drums, and I start establishing where things are hitting volume, and then I move on from there. Right. Yeah. And there is a practicality to that in the sense that in most sessions, the drums are going to have the most number of mics and tracks and... Um, yeah. the most information to deal with, even yeah. though it's one instrument. Um, right. But you were talking a little bit earlier about setting your gain structure. Um, I wonder if, if you were going to suggest to somebody who struggles with that, mm. whether they're in the box or they're summing out to analog, do you have any um, suggestions on, on setting a, a good gain structure and kind of having a, a method to that? Well... I, I wish I had a, a very clear answer for that, and I don't. And that and mainly that be, is because everybody's got a different system they're working on. Mm -hmm. So one big variable in that is whether you're in the analog or digital domain. Um, now, most of the time, people, even if they're working analog, they're still working in some kind of hybrid fashion. They're, they're playing back from a hard disk, or they're doing that, and they're printing back into Pro Tools or Logic. Um, I mean, mainly at my studio here, I'm doing mostly that. I have a hybrid analog set, set up here, so I'm, I'm multi-tracking out of Pro Tools into my Dangerous 2 bus, and that eventually it goes through the analog chain, and then it eventually winds up back as a two-track digitally back into Pro Tools. Um, so the gain structure there, um, there's a few different uh, points which are to be discussed. One, one is just simply multi-track outputs of the analog interface. Um, 
that you all obviously have gain structure with the analog gear itself, but then you have a gain structure when you're printing back into analog. You have another conversion to there's an A to D there, mm -hmm. and then you have your level to tape essentially. Um, all of those are important along the line. Now, as the Pro Tools, I mean, I, I use Pro Tools specifically, but I know people are using Logic and Ableton and different things. But the Mix Bus in Pro Tools has improved drastically over the years. So the internal gain structure in the internal Mix Bus, uh, you have to treat it, or you don't have to worry about it as much, I should say, because you treat it differently because they now have forgiveness with headroom. Mm -hmm. But you still have analog outputs. So if, for example, on my summing uh, rig, like my HDI with 16 outputs, if I'm outputting something analog there and it's clipping, that's a problem. Um, but you, you still have to worry about, for me, uh, tracks that are you know in the red or that sort of thing. And, and it's not something that you want to record that way. I mean, maybe you're doing that as, a, as an effect, that's a different story, but generally speaking, you're not recording vocal and letting that hit into the red and you know you have this clipped track that you now have to deal with mm -hmm. in the mix and and now you can overdrive certain plugins and not get any uh, you can get a desired distortion from that but um, in terms of the uh, outputs analog and all that yeah, I try to be careful with that so but going back to what you said at the beginning the advice for the levels on that that it, it's there's no set level for me um, that I can tell somebody because it's going to depend on a, a few factors, mainly also what you're doing with your stereo bus. Mm -hmm. um, usually, when I'm printing back in, and even if I'm mixing in the box and I have a, a, a master fader, um, what's going on on the master bus will add gain um, almost almost all the time. So I, ne I never have my levels uh, going into that bus too hot. They're not really uh, slamming into the, really into the, if it's summing into the A to D, it's really not that hot. And I, and I, if I need some extra gain, I'll use it on, either on a plug-in or on a fader um, to get that to tape. Um, and sometimes there's a limiter involved. Um, it depends on the production. But, um, but that, so that's a little bit tricky. And, and what I would advise people is to you have to do a few mixes on that on whatever system you're working on, um, especially if it's a hybrid system. Get used to where things um, uh, uh, sound, what they sound like at the level you're mixing it at. And and if you find your your let's say you're starting a mix and you have uh, a bunch of instruments up and you know you're eight hours in and you've got no headroom and you keep dialing things back and it, then that'll t that'll tell you right at, right off the bat okay. I started off way too hot. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you have to kind of keep note of these things. So if you're trying to figure out where to start with the gain structure and you, and you don't know, when you start a mix, keep in mind where, okay, this is where things are sitting right now and I have a basic track in. Uh, I've got the full band in, I've got all the instruments, and things are hitting my meter at um, minus six or something like that. Um, if you know that that minus six became... Uh, way too hot after you start adding plugins and mixing and stuff, you know that you're going to have to dial it way back. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, so I know that's that's not a great answer because it really depends on everybody's system. You know okay. what I mean? So, so uh, in the box, it, it's to me, it's no different. You know what I mean? It, and I and I don't print that hot, uh, or I don't have my inputs to the bus to the bus that hot. So, okay. yeah. You know. And what is the role of? Um the monitoring levels in terms of are you always keep a consistent level that you listen at or that's a good question I do keep it pretty consistent um, and I, I, I go back and forth mainly between there, there's I have a few sets of monitors here I have my NS10s which mm -hmm. most people know I have my Focal Twin 6 B, BEs and then I have my little Avantones um, for the most part, I'm living on the NS10s for the bulk of the mix, right? And that is played back at a at not a very loud volume. So it, it's, I wouldn't say it's quiet, but it's not loud at all. Now I will go to the bigger Focal speakers when I need to hear something in the bottom, or when I need to hear what something's feeling like. If I need to hear how the energy is, 
but mainly once I get things established and I get rolling on a song, I'll keep it on the NS10s and I'll torture myself sometimes by not turning it up and by not switching to the more hi-fi speakers. I mean, there's some kind of torturous element to that mm -hmm. where it's it's easy to 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 reach for the for the hi-fi speaker. It's easy to um, turn it up, but I really try my hardest to refrain from that until the mix is really close, and I and I and then I absolutely need to. But so the to me the the, the benefit in that is that I'm forcing myself to hear something in this smaller stereo image where I, if I, if I want to hear impact, I'm going to need to hear it at this level. Because if I'm listening to things really loud or on a hi-fi speaker, all the moves that I'm doing and all the dynamics, um, they're, they're already kind of sweetened and over-accentuated. So, I've, and I've made that mistake um, when I was uh, learning about this uh, coming up in, in, in my early days of saying, oh, this sounds really great. Wow. Um, and then you go to a car stereo and I think, man, oh, I don't like that. Mm. What? I didn't mean to do that. Why does it sound like that? And then it's some, somebody had said, well, you're on that speaker and I won't say which speaker. Mm -hmm. They're like, that speaker is BS and you can't rely on that. I thought, okay, that's interesting. And, and I just had to learn more about speakers with that. Mm -hmm. And um, so that could be a lot of hi-fi speakers. And that doesn't mean that they're not extremely useful they are and just so everybody knows i start everything on the hi-fi speakers so so it's almost kind of like i start a mix on on the focals mm -hmm. and then i end it on the focals it kind of works that way but the the bulk of the the torturous process is on the ns10s right and i try to make it as um, good as i can and as accurate as i can on the ns10s um and usually it translate re translates really well. Yeah. So and so, are you leaning on the NS10s as the sort of common um, use of? You're you're really trying to get the mid range right and all those elements you're talking about in the mono. Um, that, that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, it's not just a mid range. It's the it's 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 low mid too. There there. I mean, one of the things that I felt that I had to work on as I've as I've started to mix more and more records is everything in that low mid um, frequency range, which sort of for me seems to be like the last frequency that you start to obsess over in your mm -hmm. in my career where I was like, oh, when I was a kid, I loved bass. Okay, I love, I love, I love bass, I love 50 hertz, 60 hertz. Okay, I know what that is, you know, I know 80 hertz, I know all that. Mm -hmm. And then you, you get into bands and you start learning about different frequencies, but it seems like the, the, the frequencies for me that, that took me the longest to kind of learn about or love were those low mid uh, frequencies really above 400 450 it was kind of like 500 600 ish almost up to 1k mm -hmm. and it it, it, I, it I had to go through my own process of realizing how important those frequencies are too um, so the ns10s are really good with that in that range too and that they that they don't have a lot of hi-fi top they don't have a lot of bottom but yeah. that's what other speakers are for and i have headphones too that i'll check things on um so it's 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 really number one i think about balance and you know where vocals are supposed to sit on an ns10 you know where a snare is supposed to sit you know where a kick drum is supposed to sit now there are some caveats to that and that is especially doing modern music where there's lots of samples or lots of super low end um subs or 808s or something like that then it, I have to uh, adjust a little bit uh, because I'm not going to hear that on the NS, on the NS10s, and, and I don't know exactly what they what the frequency range is, I, but it's not very low. Um, so in those scenarios, you just it, it's something you have to keep uh, in the back of your head the whole time you're you're. And if you need to check your subs or you need to check your bass, you might have to switch to speaker or you might have to go on headphones. But um, it, it, there's still it's still number one about balance, and, mm -hmm. and if they're balanced on that, and you know where even those bases, the bases that are not speaking very loudly on there, if you even if you know where they're supposed to sit there, um, it's still very useful. So okay. yeah. And when you're in that process, do you go back to the rough mix a lot, or what's your feeling on that? That depend. That's actually really depends on the client. Okay. Um, it's funny because I've seen a lot of people talk about how important the rough mix is. Um, 
And I think it is important. And, and then uh, sometimes if people say, oh, don't, don't worry about it, I don't need to hear it. I, to me, in my experience, it feel, I feel like the rough mix is really, it's important if the client thinks it's important. You know what I mean? There, yeah. there are times when, of course, it's absolutely paramount that you know the rough mix and the client loves the rough mix and they say, look, I want that, but with your thing on it. <laughs> right. Or I want this, but better. <laughs> or, or, or more hi-fi. Or, right. They basically want their rough mix, but they want it, you know, they want it to sound like a record. Okay, so, so you have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So the, the rough mix becomes extremely important then. There are also times when somebody says, oh, uh, just do, do what you do. Uh, that rough mix is terrible. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. So, so to me, it's client dependent. I mean, and if somebody, uh, well, let me say it this way. It's a service industry. Mm -hmm. Especially, I mean, producing, recording, mixing, they all are. But mixing in particular is a really interesting mix of this. It's half art or half creative, half art, half technical, half science. And you're combining these two. And I, and I, I can't tell you how much I love it, but it's still for somebody else. It's sure. still, I'm still serving another artist or a label. And it's important to give them what they're looking for. Now, it doesn't mean you can't make it as good as you can and do a great job, but, but the reality is that they're hiring you to get the result that they want. Mm -hmm. you know? and, so, and, and, and within that, there's, there's going to be a lot of discussion on, well, how much do you want my thing or how much do you want your rough mix or, or do you want to emulate a record that you're used to hearing? Or, you know, I mean, it's common for bands to, to, to put a record down and say, you know, I want it to sound like this, basically. Right. You know, I mean, I, the, the, one of the, there's tons of records like that. I mean, NXS Kick, it, the, there's a lot of landmark records that sound a certain way where bands say, I, I want it to sound like the, the Black Album by Metallica, um, Fleetwood Mac Rumors. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of sonically um, excellent records that people will go back to and say, you know, make it, make it like this. Yeah. You know, um, so sometimes you have to reference that, you know, or um, Green Day American Idiot is a big one in the 21st century mm -hmm. in terms of pop rock. It's, it's been referenced over and over in terms of singer. Uh, um, let's see, uh, Taylor Swift, 1989. That's a con constant, constant reference. Yeah. So, so, so there's lots of things like that where, I mean, but at that point you are trying to please somebody and give them the most accurate uh, representation of that that you can, you know. And do you feel like, um, as a mix engineer, do you feel like you have a sound or do you, to quote what you were saying earlier, really try to service the track and service the artist? It's, the, it's, it's, it's not, I, don't, I really don't think I have a sound at all. And, and I try not to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really want to make it client dependent and project dependent and every project is its own work of art in a sense so it, one of my clients that I'm mixing today has n nothing to do with the, the group or person I'll be working with next week and they shouldn't really it's it's mutually exclusive I, and, and, and in, in one way I'm, I'm a little lucky in the sense that I've been working with a wide, wide range of artists, stylistically especially. I mean, it's rock to folk to avant-garde classical to to electronic trip hop to. I mean, it's it's a lot of different styles. But because of that, it really makes the mixing styles different. And so I don't really have any kind of a sound with that. Um, I, I just try to, of course, it's project dependent. You keep the client happy and. Um, be as musical and creative as you can within that framework. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And when you're working on a project um, where you're on the actual tracking side or in the room mm -hmm. when they're writing and, and tracking uh, and you're behind the, that console, how is your experience here, you know, doing mixing work, um, how has that changed you as a, as a tracking engineer? It, that's a good question. I think it's changed in one regard, and that is that you, or I would tend to make quicker decisions. 
Okay. And I'll know exactly, or I'll know, I'll know, I'll get no closer to what I'll want to get, especially if I know I'm going to be mixing it. Um, there's no sense in, I mean, I've never been a big fan of recording just tons of tracks just to have them. I mean, I, I've never really done that anyways. I mean, if you have a request, then you might do it, but I try to make as many commitments to tape as possible. Um, but even with that said, I mean, it, it does make you, it's like you grow up when you make records, you know that certain things aren't necessary. Mm -hmm. And you have the maturity to, to just say, look, why are you doing that? You don't need to, to record all that. Just, you know, you need two mics here or three or, you know, you don't need seven. Or, I mean, there are, there are times when I've gotten projects and I'll have a, a, a no, no joke, I'll have a mono source, but there's nine microphones. Um, and <laughs> there's a very good chance I'm not going to use all those nine microphones in a mix. Um, now, if I'm, if I'm, let's say I'm doing that same project, hypothetically, I go into the studio, there's a very good chance I'm just going to make it um, concise. And it, that could be very easily just three microphones. Mm -hmm. You know, that nine microphones could become three. Um, and I'll know right away, well, I'm getting what I need out of these room mics. I have a spot mic here. This is, this is going to work. And I don't have this ridiculous phase relationship going on with all these different mics all the time. It, it can actually give you, uh, for people that are, are doing this sort of thing and they're recording an instrument where you have a, a ton of microphones, keep in mind that that can really cause you a lot of problems down the road. And you, now you, what, you would, what I would recommend is you go into a room and you use your ears to understand, okay, I'm going to try and do this in an efficient way too. It's not just, yes, you want it to sound good, but you're making a record, so maybe you already have 100 tracks. Um, all that stuff matters. It all adds up when you're in charge of making a record. Mm -hmm. So, I, so I, I mean, I feel like, you know, as, as years go on, I try my best to be as efficient as possible, make smart decisions. Um, and of course, if I am, if I am going to mix it as well, I'll know, uh, I'll have my, my way of editing things and comping things. And, right. Um, I don't want any, I mean, for me, I mean, uh, I don't want any pops. I don't want any ticks. I don't want any, at none. I, I, I won't have any of that. So I have my own way of doing it. Um, and it's not a special way. It's just that it's thorough. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and would you say that, that, um, a lack of decision making or a lack of committing to things to tape um, is that is that more problematic these days than you would say in the past? It's definitely more. It's uh, you're saying problematic in some cases. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely more apparent. I mean, it happens a lot, it, and it, you'll get you'll get uh, tracks that, like I said, uh, have an insane amount of microphones. But really, you say, all right, well. These two are in phase. <laughs> I'll go with those. Right. Um, and most of the time, it's fine. It works great. I mean, there 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 may be some occasions where um, the artist might say, "Oh, I really wanted to do this," and okay, you may have to uh, find a way to do that. Um, but uh, most of the time, you, you you try to you use your own ears. I mean, it's almost like, especially when it, you you get handed a song and you've never you don't know what the guts of it are. You know what I mean? You might have heard a rough mix, but you don't know um, anything about uh, what the microphones were, anything. And you get in on a session and you start opening up and you start, oh, this is, these were all the bodies are buried and this is, you see what's going on in the production and you hear what's going on in production. Um, it, in, in, that, in that case, you, you get better and better at just making concise decisions on, on uh, what to omit. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the best things about mixing is the mute button. <laughs> right. Really. It's just kind of like, all right, we don't need that. That's taking up a lot of space, and it not only it's there. And again, when you you do it more and more, there are some things that not only are they not needed, but they take up a weird amount of space for how unimportant they are to the song. Mm -hmm. So you can really you can really gain a ton by just focusing at least on the start at the most important parts of the song, and and then kind of building from there and you can sometimes you meet you mute stuff and they don't even the artist don't, doesn't know uh, now I try to be really transparent where I will 
if that's the case, I will just tell them. You know, I, it, there's no real secret about it. Mm -hmm. I just say, look, that that for whatever reason isn't working. Mm -hmm. And if you're happy with the way that sounds, there's probably a reason. You know, um, and it's not usually a problem. I mean, it, but occasionally there's there's the times when there's one very important <laughs> instrument, and it makes its way, even though you might have initially thought probably not needed, taking up a little bit too much space. But that's when you have to use your skills as a mixer to somehow fit that in the song, whether or not that might be your first instinct. You know, right? Yeah. Okay. And I think that starts to touch on um, a conversation we were having off camera um, about session organization mm. and also um, a misconception or maybe a misuse of terms. And we were talking about multi tracks versus stems. Right. And yeah, this uh, we're we're going to post a link below in the description to the uh, the Reddit thread on this topic. It's it's become a very hot topic in the the audio uh, engineer uh, forums. But um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So let's see how how would I dive in. Well, a friend a good friend of mine. His name's uh, Richard Wilkinson. He's a great producer, engineer, mixer in the UK. And um, known him a long time now. And uh, he it's funny we were somehow talking about this topic and he said I started a reddit forum on this and he sent me the link and I, I got I got through what he said on it and I thought this is brilliant I mean this and it's such a it, you're right it is such a hot topic it, I mean particularly with mixers mm -hmm. I mean that's really who, who I talk to who's having these these kinds of discussions um, so the, the the gist of it is basically the difference between uh, stems and uh, multi-track and what they both mean and we could probably talk about this for many many hours yeah. um, well, well let's we, keep it simple yeah, let's we'll, say yeah. for you as a mix engineer how do you prefer to have it delivered well there's a couple an there's a couple ways to answer that um, and I'll just I'll try to keep it simple but uh, yeah we'll put we'll post the link and you guys can check out the forum the reddit forum because it's really good and there's a lot of useful information on there um, and Richard did a great job of presenting the question um, but basically the so people understand stems are submixes stems are a submix of an existing piece of music so um, it could be anything really but in, in, in for the sake of our conversation, you know, let's say we have a, a, a song, all those tracks in the song are considered the multi-track. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the stems that people um, are refer that I would refer to in the proper definition would be, let's say you take the drums in that song and you mix them, you, you mix them down to a stereo track. Okay. That stereo track is now what's now called a stem, mm -hmm. and so on. And you can do that over and over, or, or you can divide it up however you like within any song. Nowadays, it seems as if stems have become have replaced the word multi-track. So a lot of times people will say, I'll send you the stems for a song, and I might think, well, are you sending me a bunch of stereo submixes for the song, or are you sending me the multi-track? And I really don't know until I get it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I may ask and I won't even get an answer because they actually don't know, understand the question. So for, for people that are wondering, that there is a distinction there. Now, now the confusion is also because people are replacing the word multi-track with stems. Um, now, to get to the other part of your question, what, what do I like delivered to me? Um, in, in most of the time you want to have a multi-track recording delivered to you. Now there's a couple things to say about that. And this, and Richard touches upon this in his forum as well. And, and that is that if you get it, let's say you get a, st a session sent to you and it's 20 stereo stems and there's a lot of information packed in those stems and you, the drums are a stereo stem, there's strings, there's... Some of them actually might be fine the way they are. I mean, there, there are productions, especially where I'll say to the producer, okay, how big is the session? Oh, there's 400 tracks. I think, okay, that's a lot. I really don't want to deal with all that right now. 
let's let's submix that some of that down. I mean, there might be eighty tracks of vocals that can easily become two or three stereo stems. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and if the producer and the artist are happy with that balance, you can use that going forward. Um, but so let's say you got twenty stereo stems, and I say, well, everything is so pre-mixed I can only do so much here and there why don't you give me the multi-track so I can break out the drums break out the lead vocals you know you might have a a stereo stem with lead vocals and all this reverb and delay all over it and you know that can make it extremely difficult to uh, make a dynamic mix Um, but then you get a session that's 400 tracks and all these non-decisions and you think okay well this isn't really done either you know what I mean? This is not a, a, a track that you can press play on and you actually get a finished production. So what I would like to have ultimately is a finished production. And if there's stems involved, it's okay as long as it's a balance that's, appro- that's really been approved by the artist or producer. I mean, backing vocals are a good example because a lot of times they'll have very specific needs about which parts of the harmony should be louder than others. Every singer is different. I mean, I know some singers that are really, they always push their lower harmonies up really loud. And then some that are, are the opposite. They barely want them in there. They just want to be felt a little bit. And if that's what their balance is that they're happy with, that's okay. Um, the main elements which seem to be problematic for me within a mix, again, going back to drums and vocals, it's, it's because the drums, um, if you're just submixing them down, they tend to lose impact. So you need those those individual elements in order to adjust them to make a punchier mix, in my opinion. Um, and then with vocals, if you're going to have um, a lead vocal with effects, that's okay. Um, but you want to ha- provide a dry vocal too. So you want to have a dry vocal, and then you want to have your effects there or printed separately. I mean, there's no and there's no guarantee that whatever anybody's going to send you, you're going to have the same plugins. Right. And I say this too to people: if there's a an effect or a plugin or a, a reverb or, de, or a delay or anything that's important to your song or production, certainly include it and print it separately. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, you'll you'll start from an area where you're putting your own EQs and compressors on things, um, and you're adding your own effects. But if there's a really cool effect that is is not repeatable easily that you've got to print it mm-hmm. you know and and there's times when they'll say oh just go ahead and do what you what you want to do effect wise but then um you'll send a mix and then they'll say oh yeah but the delay in the in the chorus is different now <laughs> right and so well yeah okay so well i really liked my delay on my rough mix um can we use that well, sure we can um but and that's okay but that's the kind of scenario where you would say all right well print a stem of that delay that you really like mm-hmm. you know maybe it's a space echo or something like that that's really distinctive um and then you and then you can you have a wet and drive blending that into your mix yeah you know? so so that's kind of my and like i said we could talk about that for hours because there's so many variables there but um that's kind of the gist of it is yeah. is, is a finished production you know and and if there's some stems involved that's fine as long as they're uh, approved yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and also your future proofing, right? Because we don't know in the next five, ten years, even beyond what music delivery is going to look like. And there may be times when we need to go back and revisit these multi tracks, and those plugins may not exist anymore. Well, that's a good point. That's a really good point. I mean, it, and that kind of brings up another issue, which is archival, mm-hmm. and which is not happening these days it's not even nearly the way it used to and there's a lot of reasons for that too mainly money um most bands and groups don't want to don't have the budget or don't want to take the time or spend the money whatever it is to actually once a project is done now prep it for archival um and with that that archival you are future proofing for future remixes or or any kind of um scenario where you might need those tracks maybe in a film down the road um and the stems won't give you what you need 
Um, maybe you need to mute certain elements that are in a stem. Mm. And if they're in the stem, what do you do? You know, and if you're missing a multi-track, it's a, that can be a time-consuming um, scenario. I mean, it, it's because when you're making things for archive, you are doing things where you're including the effects because you don't know, like you said, if 10 or 15 years, you're going to be able to open that session and that plug-in will work. Yeah. It, it, you know, maybe that company's gone out of business and the authorizations aren't even there. It could, could be a number of things, you know. And so that should be happening more than it is, but um, it, unfortunately it isn't. But, but um, yeah, you are future-proofing to a certain degree, but the, the archival thing, which is another discussion, should... should uh, that's kind of a... It's funny. That's almost kind of a scary discussion, I think, for a lot of bands because you mention that stuff for them and they're just kind of... Uh, do we have to talk about that right now? I yeah. think, well, no, but I'm telling you, so at least I've said it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I've said it. You can't, you can't say that it isn't needed mm -hmm. at, at some point, especially if you, you know, most bands think they're going to be a band forever. You know, they, 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 they maybe they're only going to be a band for one more year, or maybe they're going to be around for 40 years. Who knows? But, um. But if you uh, are acting the part <laughs> and you think you're going to be a band for 40 years, then uh, prep for your stuff to be, like you said, future-proofed and archived and, and, and you have it so that ideally you have files made. So no matter what the DAW is in the future, you have consolidated archival-ready files that you can import into anything. And you have, and you, again, you hit play and you're basically getting the master recording that's that's there that's been you know preserved yeah. with the EQ with the compre with the effect um, because a lot of, for example records that are mixed on consoles um, all that has to run through the channel so in that case you need to print those tracks through the console for archival is that what, you know what i mean right so there's a lot of Things that, I mean, the multi-track is obviously the, the most important part and consolidating that and making sure you have a file to work from. And you're not always probably going to be able to guarantee a perfect recall of a mix, but you can at least guarantee that you have a, a recall of the recording. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that brings up to um, the idea of versioning and mm -hmm. what you're delivering as a mix, mix engineer. Uh, what is... I know there's not an exact standard, but what typically, how many different versions of a finished track will you deliver? Well, usually, I mean, I have a system that I do um, that's usually, um, when I know a mix is really done, because, you know, there could be a, a couple recalls, um, and I don't really want to mess around with any versions until I really know that we're signed off. Mm -hmm. And then I know if it's mixed two or three or five, whatever it is, um, I don't want to sit there and, and talk runoff versions yet because um, it's just a, it's not efficient um, and, it, and it's time consuming. So once I know that a mix has been signed off on and it's approved, basically I'll, I'll always do um, minimally an instrumental version of that mix and I'll do uh, a TV track. And for people that don't know what a TV track is, it's basically um, uh, a mix minus the lead vocal and effects. So you have a mix basically sitting there with your backing vocals and the idea with that in, in back in the day was that you could have this TV track and a singer could go on TV or go on a talk show or something and by themselves he or she could sit there with a mic and perform the song and they'd have the band behind them right. minus their lead vocal and it would sound like a performance but, uh, but also do an instrumental a TV track maybe some acapellas, uh, maybe I'll do a, a, a vocal only, lead vocal only, uh, then backing vocals only. And then from there, uh, I will print vocal ups and downs if needed. Um, it's not um, requested as much anymore. I, I mean, I, I used to always do a vocal um, up one dB and a vocal up half a dB plus a vocal down one dB and a vocal down half a dB. Always. But now it's getting to the point now where if, if the, I mean, we, we labor over these mixes, the vocals are the right level. I mean, if there's a, I mean, and a dB change on a vocal mix is drastic mm. now. So 
if there's a change that needs to be made, it's almost kind of like, well, I'll recall the mix and print you a new mix with that, with the, with the whatever, let's say, you know, verse one or whatever, the vocal needs to be a little louder. Mm -hmm. I'll make that change so that you have a brand new mix to work from. It doesn't mean I won't print them, but it's just not as common as, as it used to be. Sure. You know what I mean? And, and, and they can be good safety measures, especially if you know your your schedule is crazy, and, you're, and which mine is, and, and you travel a lot, or you're going in and out of different studios. I mean, I mix here a lot, but there might be a project I'm producing uh, in a studio, or I'm mixing in another room, um, and you're not able to get to that recall. So in that case, the vocal ups and downs... Um, you, you can slice in those sections as you need them. And so, so they're still important. Um, it's just not as requested as it, as it used to be. Right. But, um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll usually do a DB up, half a DB up, a DB down, half a DB down. Instrumental, TV track, DB only, lead vocal only. And I print those with the effects. So as you're making that stem, the effects that go on the lead, the effects that go on the back and vocals, they're all printed into that stem. Um, and then outside of that, there, that's pretty much it. Now, I will make special versions for clients if it's requested. Um, and sometimes it is. I mean, there are also um, clients that need stems made for a touring. So they're like, well, we, we need to have that keyboard stem because we're going out on the road and we don't have a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all those, all those cool sounds we need on a stem and we're going to play back on live or Pro Tools. And so right. so you'll do that too. But that's kind of... That's kind of when things are done. Most of the time, you're you're done with the mix. You've printed those versions. The versions are there for archival too, in a sense. And then they say, okay, hey, we're we need these stems for live performance. So, you know, this is what we need. So, yeah. yeah. So, if we can go back to what we were talking about in the beginning, where we started with gain structure, mm -hmm. um, and you work with a really diverse range of clients. A lot of them are geographically very far away. So you're working remotely, you know, through email, uh, Skype, what have you. Um, I think one thing that a lot of uh, engineers, and I'll put myself in this category, struggle with is setting the vocal level, you know, in that first mix that you're going to deliver to the client. What's the process like for you, or if it, especially if it's someone you've never worked with before? I, mm. I assume you're going to talk to the producer, and, and but do you familiarize yourself with maybe other recordings of the artist to get a sense of where they like their vocal to sit or how, how do you approach that? Well, I do as much work beforehand as possible. Okay. So if, if I can speak to the artist, I will. If I can speak to the producer, I will. Uh, if there are references that they want me to know about, then I will certainly listen to them. Um, and, and some artists have more kind of demands or wishes than others where there's one artist I, I worked with recently who had a very, very detailed notes on on all of his references, um, which is great. I got zero problem with that. I, I the more the better because listen, I'm like I said, we're in the service business. I, I if you if you're giving me these three albums and it's a, uh, you know from from Sam and Dave to James Blake or or whatever it is, I need to know that. Mm -hmm. Now, you may find that. They may not sound like the song that you're being given, but there's a reason why the reference is being given. Um, or you might not get that much at all. You might get, you might get somebody that says, "Oh well, I I want it to sound kind of like my last album," or I don't, mm -hmm. or or I don't know. I really like that Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young album here, and and it may be really vague, and that's okay too. You know, you just you you have to just find find where where to go with it creatively especially if you're not given a lot of references but you I do the best I can to say what are you looking for I mean I it, it, certainly when I'm producing a record those discussions are are had a lot and in, 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 in pre-production and I want to know as much as possible about okay what what kind of album are we trying to make and and it can go a thousand different ways every day every hour it's a different you know and every minute is a different decision that affects the shape of what the record's going to sound like. Um, so in that in that regard, uh, as a producer as well, but it, but as a mixer, I'll still have those conversations, saying, "Listen, and and don't be afraid to tell me what you really want. You know, don't 
because this this kind of there was a phase of this too i feel where there were bands that wanted to be kind of cool or whatever and they'd give me all these like hip references like it could be the band or whatever it was or mm-hmm. um or they're like yo check out this old depeche mode thing or check out this and it's like th- and they're all cool records and you think all right cool yeah i get that okay all right all right let me get to work and then you come back and i'm like oh cool um that's great, but um, but what about this? And they play you extremely modern pop rock or pop. pop. And I said, okay, well, that's cool too, but that's not what we talked about. Right. So um, we can do that, but it's going to be a little bit of a different approach. So in trying to save uh, really hours in the day, I do, I, I do the best I can about having a really frank conversation before we start and and i and i say listen and don't be afraid to tell me something first of all don't be afraid to tell me that you don't like something if i'm giving you a mix and there's something that you don't like tell me i've got no ego about it Mm -hmm. i just want it to be good and i want it to be correct so don't don't tell you don't have to feed my my ego at all and we're here i'm here for you but also with that being said it's it don't be afraid to tell me what you think you want musically and think that I'm going to judge you on it or something. Yeah. You know, if you really are digging this, you know, this Taylor Swift record, Swift record, that's fine. That, that, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but don't be afraid to tell me and just tell me, for example, uh, I, I, you keep talking about this Joni Mitchell record and this, right. And, and then there's a PJ Harvey record. Those are all great. But then, and, and then think, well, I really wanted to say Taylor Swift, but I, didn't want to right it's, like, oh, look, it's okay you know so so i do my best to really have as much conversation as possible it's mm-hmm. like don't hesitate to tell me whatever you want what are you looking for i don't care how left field it is I, it, it doesn't matter to me you know what i mean and and it, again it's like a, it's it's part of that service part of the job i mean it doesn't mean you can't have your own integrity with it mm-hmm. which i try to do very i mean i'm absolutely try to do that on every mix but um the the you can have your own integrity in making it a creative uh piece of piece of art in trying to also give them what they want you know what i mean you don't have to like sell out to feel like it it's always a sellout or something like that if you're if you're you know being given a a reference and you're trying to make it sound like something you know what i mean so yeah and do you feel like um, you have any sort of responsibility since you have such a, a broad understanding of, you know, different trends and techniques and, and like you can listen to the current the Spotify viral 50 or mm-hmm. and listen to those mixes and, and you kind of, OK, I know what's going on. I know what people are doing these days. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you do you have any responsibility to, to try to keep um, the artists that you're working with like, hey, I know you like these older references but also we want to try to make it sound okay with other contemporary music it happens or? all the time okay it, it happens all the time i mean it, it, it's 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 a very common thing to talk about i mean it's it's like it, it, you can't really pin it down to one style of music but there's plenty of times uh, and examples of somebody saying oh man i really love the way this uh, Marina and the Diamonds album sounds. It's spectacular. And it's, it, um, but I also really like this Kate Bush album. And sonically, they're completely different. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but they're both brilliant in their own ways. I mean, th- those are two of my favorite artists. Um, so for me, you know, something like that is, is, is actually a really interesting challenge, you know, because I'm dealing with uh, something that might have been recorded a long time ago and it's got production that has values from let's say 1980 or something but then you have a, a much more modern production with a lot more synthetic drum samples and that sort of thing and you think all right well how can i marry the two i mean i i, I like that kind of thing but um yeah yeah this may be a, a very broad question but do you do you think we can still in this era we're in make timeless music I mean, I I do. I I think it's I think it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but you you want to go into something trying to 
make it as good as it can be. I mean, I know that's super, maybe kind of cheesy, but yeah, I think it's possible. I mean, it, 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 it it's always going to become harder and harder to do because making records is now an old, this is an old business now. I mean, mm-hmm. we're, we're, everything is post everything, <laughs> you know, post rock, post punk, right. post hip hop, post everything. Um, and so what are these new forms and new styles? And they're all derivatives of something. You know, there's right. very few real original forms of music coming out now. So it makes things harder. And, and that's just a challenge in a way. I mean, but I think, sure, there's things that can still be timeless. I mean, yeah. Do you think it's the current era maybe is more about um, hybridization rather than necessarily genres moving forward? I don't know, actually. That that's a really good question that I don't have an answer for. But I mean, uh, pr- probably no. I don't think it's really hybridization. I mean, it, that is a it's happening nonstop, and that's okay. Um, I think that things could be really pushed forward if there are new forms that have not that are less sort of a hybrid. And I know that may sound strange, but. I mean, hip hop's a really good example, but uh, but now hip hop's not it's not new anymore, right? You know, um, it, it, I mean, there's the there's kind of the electronic wave in the '90s and the, well, I should say MIDI and the '80s and dance groups and all this stuff, but it, that had mostly to do with technology, um, and now everything is kind of a hodgepodge of styles. So I don't know what what is going to happen with that, but. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a hybrid. If there's going to be a big uh, advancement in something, I think it's going to be somebody's original idea. Um, that, and, and of course, look, it's going to come from somewhere, but it may not be something that's really identifiable. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, when I, I sometimes I'll take references of my own that are not even musical references. They're, they're references from a, 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 a painting. You think, all right, well, I'm mixing this bridge, and it reminds me of this Rothko painting. And I know that's re- that can be really hard to understand, and, and you don't need to understand it. But like, it's to me, it's going to be like ideas like that, where it's a totally original uh, style coming from out of left field. That those are the kinds of things that are going to push things forward. I mean, now everything is kind of it's wild west hybrid everything. You know the, the country hip hop now, and, right? Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I, I just saying that makes me laugh. Yeah. Country hip hop, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's yeah, that's where we're I was at. Yeah. Just this past weekend, I was uh, with my niece and nephew, who are uh, eight and six respectively, and we walked into a big box store where you know you can barely hear the music, mm-hmm. and they latched onto it like immediately, oh, yeah. like. You know, like it was a Beatles song or what? I mean, they knew every word, and so I guess I guess to maybe to answer my own question, that's a s- signal that there is timeless music because um, I feel like you know if it's something that children can latch on to, you know, that's well, that's a good point. I didn't I didn't really think about it like that, but that's a good point. And I mean, I know my son who just turned seven. He it's funny because he'll he'll know a song on the radio, and I think. I'll look back in the car and I'm like, you know that song? <laughs> and he knows, and you're right, he knows all the words. Yeah. And he's like grooving to it. I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah, all right. And yeah. that's that's when we feel like old men, right? Well, I mean, it, it also makes me feel like, oh, you have an opinion on that song. Mm-hmm. You like it. And I might like it too, but I might not. I might think, oh, you like that song? Why? And he's seven years old, but he's got an opinion on it. Sure. I'm like, all right, well, all right, cool. And I'll say, do you want me to add it to your Spotify playlist? Um, and he'll say yes or no. So, so, so my son Julian, he I have a my own Spotify playlist for him. Uh, so he's got a, a bunch of songs in there. Right now, his current favorite song is TNT by ACDC. But um, okay. So he will. It, it, sometimes I'll put my playlist on and I'll say, Hey, Julian, if you hear a song you dig, just tell me and I'll add it to your playlist. So this we have this kind of back and forth with that. But there are plenty of times that he'll hear a song and I was like yeah add that to my playlist and I'll go <laughs> are you sure yeah okay I'm just double checking you sure you want to add that to your playlist alright and I'll go 
and I'll add it. I'll go, all right. Yeah. Darn. Well, I appreciate yeah. that you're giving him the, <laughs> the buffet of choices to choose from because yeah. you know the if you try to be the, you know, yeah. push things on and that's no, going to backfire. Saying, I'm not saying know. no to any of it. Yeah. I mean, uh, of course, with the caveat, I mean, there are some songs with uh, too many bad words. So sure. at this point, it's kind of like, all right, well, can't hear that one yet. But, you know, yeah. soon, but not quite. <laughs> not quite there yet. So, great. Yeah.